All right, welcome everybody. We've got um, on the channel today, I've got a really special guest. Peter Serzi is with the FBI and I'm super excited. I've actually been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while. Um, Peter, you reached out to me um, through my channel a little while ago and noticed that you have just a wealth of e expertise and, and um, experience in not only human resources, but also in a talent acquisition and with the FBI specifically. And I know that there's a lot of people that look at the FBI kind of with this level of mystique. Um, so I, I felt like I, I couldn't resist to just invite you on the channel and really have a, a conversation for those who are looking to get into the FBI and um, start a career there or, or kind of mid-career come into the FBI, I really think that this could be a lot of a, a ton of value. So I'm really excited to jump into your background and appreciate you coming on. So first of all, welcome, uh, welcome to the channel. Yeah, thanks for the uh, invitation and, you know, super excited always to talk yeah. about, you know, working for the federal government and working for the FBI in um, particular. Obviously, I love that. And so, you know, happy to uh, yeah. chat and I love your channel and it's, it's great. Yeah, and I, I don't know how I feel about the FBI watching this. No, no, P I am watching your channel. Like, I am a giant HR nerd, so I am watching your channel. The FBI is not watching No, your no, channel. no, I'm just, I'm just planning because we had to go through the oh, approval process and all that oh, yeah. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that there's probably some I, – I just say that jokingly. Um, <laughs> so so anyway, I, I wanted to give you kind of a formal introduction, and then I'm going to let you kind of introduce yourself in a little bit more detail. But you spent the last four years as a uh, the head of talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, in the, So you're, you're an HR guy through and through. And um, you recently, very, very recently moved out of that role and into something else, but you're still kind of doing the handoffs and all that stuff yeah. but if you've got you've had a basically you've made a career at the fbi for a, a bunch of years so do you want to just give us a little bit of insight as to your background how you got into the fbi kind of what you're you know what you've been up to what your career path has been yeah sure um so uh, i started uh with the fbi as a japanese uh translator um took japanese in college on a total whim you know changed the course of my life you know like sometimes those decisions do you know whenever he's taught english came back you know, saw an ad on the internet, applied, you know, so it's not like I had this like dream as a child of working to the FBI, you know, like a lot of people. So um, worked as a linguist, awesome. Um, and then uh, spent really the first half of my career in the FBI's foreign language program. I mean, if you think about it, um, like if the FBI does a drug bust, um, you know, all the wiretaps are in Spanish, uh, they might uh, do a white collar crime investigation and Swedes, you know, sees like 500 boxes of Swedish, you know, like Somebody's got to translate that. So the Bureau has a very large foreign language program. So um, spent the first half of my career in operations, uh, both su directly supervising translators and then moving work around the country. Um, and then uh, got into HR, you know, sort of sideways, like a lot of people um, mm -hmm. ended up uh, over the program that hires and recruits all FBI linguists for all 56 field offices. So, you know, in the resume mine, sitting at the tables at recruiting events, you know, doing all the things that, you know, you do. Um, that was great. Really fell in love with that. Did that for about five years. Uh, and then um, about uh, four and a half years ago, five years ago, we had a new head of um, HR. He pulled me up to be his special assistant because he didn't know anything. Uh, and he's like, oh, you've been here forever. Help me out. Uh, and then the prior head of talent acquisition, a couple months later, retired, and I was lucky enough to get that slot. So, yeah, for the last four and a half years, that's what I've done. About a month ago, um, our boss's boss, uh, you know, decided to move me over to our finance group. Uh, they had a long time uh, vacancy, a lot of modernization projects, and uh, uh, which I've experience with. So, you know, I'm now supervising 200 accountants and figured that out. Uh, but for uh, the four and a half years as the head of talent acquisition, you know, I oversee the team that hires for all 56 field offices of the FBI, all of our headquarters entities. So all roles of the FBI except sort of our internal leadership roles for agents, my colleague um, in our uh, talent management group uh, sort of does those. But uh, yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah. And so you, it, it sounds like you've got a, a pretty large scope of work then inside of TA and TA is typically siloed into different functions, mm -hmm. uh, but you're, and I would imagine with the FBI, because of how big it is that your, your department basically handled everything, including, you know, the, the things that you'd see on TV, the field agents, all the way to the yep. kind of more boring stuff. Like, yeah, you know, if, if you were trying, if you were trying to get into the bureau, that was all me. So I also would also have like recruiting, employment marketing, some workforce development stuff, um, position classification, which is like writing job descriptions. Uh, deciding if there's a new job that needs to exist. Uh, so the things that sort of fell outside my lane would be comp of benefits, um, talent management, uh, sort of internal leadership decisions, um, 
uh, learning and development that falls into our training division lane. Uh, and then um, there's sort of the whole internal leadership pipeline uh, that also sort of falls outside of my wheelhouse. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's good, but it's a lot. So let's start with the probably the reason why a lot of people will be on this on this uh, particular video. But if I wanted to become a field agent, an FBI agent, kind of what I see on TV, what what does somebody need to do in order to get started in that field? Would you walk me through what that? Yeah, yeah. So be? yeah, let's just like sort of frame it. So the FBI is like thirty five thousand people yeah, all around the country. We have about five hundred jobs at the FBI. An agent is one. So. Uh, there are about 14,000 agents in the Bureau and everybody else is, you know, 499 other things. So um, obviously everybody is drawn to, you know, sort of what they see on TV, you know, like these amazing agents and Lear jets flying around the country, killing, you know, getting serial killers, you know, with great abs and, you know, super great eye makeup. Uh, Investigating you know, the, aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and being an agent, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not an agent. I'm an HR specialist and a linguist, but uh, you know, the agent does a great job. So uh, for that, you know, they're, they're really looking at people who have a college degree and several years of post-college uh, work experience. Um, there's a pretty rigorous process, which I could talk about. Um, and then uh, you're going to go to Quantico for 20 weeks. Uh, and then they're going to assign you to some, you know, field, one of the 56 field offices. And you're going to work sort of two years under a more experienced agent while you're at the FBI Academy at Quantico. Uh, that's where they'll teach you you know, not just the, all the legal uh, things that you have to know. Um, it's not the case that everybody in the, all agents come in with a criminal, criminal justice degree. That is not actually necessarily very common at all. You know, we sort of teach you that part as well as sort of the um, you know, defensive tactics, um, all the law, the intelligence cycle, you know, things like that. Um, you discriminate so, yeah. for the degree type. Do you discriminate on certain ones? Is there, is there a, and I should discriminate in, in terms of, are there certain degree types that you really focus on and then you look at primarily and don't consider other ones? Uh, there's no degree that we do not consider. Um, and some of our best agents come from very unexpected career fields. Actually, like maybe three years ago, we ran a whole ad campaign for a year called Unexpected Agent, where we focused on agents that came out of like psychology and middle school, being a middle school teacher and, hmm. you know, biology, things like that. Um, it's definitely the case that we are always looking for um, uh, people with law degrees, accounting degrees, um, any sort of computer science or STEM uh, related degree. Uh, we're always looking for foreign language speakers. Um, so those are sort of the, the things that if you want to say they sort of float to the top uh, of the applicant pool. Um, that would be fair to say. Uh, but, you know, we're always looking for uh, people that are really committed to, um, you know, making their communities better. You know, I think that is the first thing that you have to have if you want to work in any job at the FBI is, you know, you're, you're really joining an organization that is trying to, you know, protect the American people, uphold the constitution. It's right there on the wall of the building. You cannot get away, you know, from that mission. And, uh, you know, so that's got you, first of all, you really have to want to like make the world a better place, like for real. Um, and then I'll also say in, in the age role specifically, but really in any role, you know, the Bureau wants intellectually curious people um, who want to, you know, uh, understand more about the world they're in. They want people with great um, interpersonal skills, lots of em ability to show empathy when needed. Um, they want people that are committed to lifelong learning and show a lot of uh, learning agility um, so that they are confident that you can come in, uh, learn what you need to do, but then you'll continue to grow and develop uh, as a special agent over time. And, you know, bro more broadly speaking, you know, that's kind of the, the, the core of the, the person that we want in all roles at the FBI. Uh, and then finally, for the agent role specifically, obviously, you have to be very physically fit. There's a physical fitness test that you have to take, um, push-ups, sit-ups, uh, run, a sprint, uh, and it's all very, um, you know, points-based thing. It's all on our website. It, it's tough, um, but, you know, I mean, they want you to be able to, like, run down the bad guy and, yeah, you know, sure. help break down a door, so I feel like that's important. Um, but that's really the only role that has, there are a few minor roles that have other physical things, but that's the only one with, like, the, this physical fitness test. Yeah, so let's talk about the uh, the background. So we talked a little bit about the degree types that you would look at. What about, and you said that in order to get it, it, it be considered for a special agent that you would have to have some real life experience. Does it matter the kind of real life experience or what's that background look like? 
Yeah, so for the agent role specifically, we say professional work experience. We're really looking at are a couple of things. Certainly, if you have a degree, a job that requires a certain degree to be that job. So obviously, you cannot be a lawyer if you do not have a law degree. So lawyers, accountants, doctors, nurses, you know, where this work experience follows directly from this very extensive degree field, right? That would be, and so we're that kind of work experience for sure. Um, other kinds of things that count as professional work experience typically are things where um, there's an extensive um, learning uh, during your first, uh, you know, months or year on the job, you know, you're, you really have to learn a lot to perform that job. So um, it's a little fuzzy in the sense that, you know, you, you can have a quite a wide array of jobs, but I would say uh, if it's a job where you can quickly acquire the skill set, um, you know, with almost no training, that's probably, we're not going to probably consider that, you know, professionalized work experience. Um, so Just curious, what's, what's yeah, what would the thought process be as far as, you know, I'm a recruiter and I'm looking at candidates who are applying, what would the thought process be for that being a, a bar that you set, you know, that they have to have something that takes effort in order or a specialized skill set, but professional, you know, versus, I, you know, I always thought if you were going to get into the FBI as an agent, you would probably have to go and get a criminal law, maybe be a detective or, or in the law enforcement or maybe military background, and then move into that. So you're saying that potentially if I had a, you know, I was an HR manager, for example, mm -hmm. that, that, that could be a profile that you would look at. Yeah, potentially. I think the, the way we sort of think of it is, um, uh, you know, when we uh, did the whole special agent selection system, you know, there are multiple tests and interviews and all along the way, you know, that's predicated on a job task analysis, like we always talk about in HR, right? What are the core skills and um, knowledge is required for the position? And when you, you know, at the very end of that, the things that you need to have when you walk into the door as a brand new FBI agent are things like uh, problem solving, analytical thinking, initiative, uh, the ability to collaborate with others. And so we feel like one of the best ways to um, demonstrate that right kind of right up front and sort of weed out um, a lot of people is, you know, what kind of job experiences have you had? It is certainly the case that as an FBI agent, you will uh, encounter a wide array of people and situations in the course of your uh, career. Uh, and so what they really want are people that have some real world life experience. They've worked in the private sector or academia or, you know, they've worked, uh, they haven't just come from, you know, undergraduate school and they've gone straight into, um, you know, straight into uh, the job as an FBI agent because like what kind of maturity of life experience do you have that you can then bring to the table, you know, as you're, you know, doing your investigative work. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we think of it. Um, yeah, that makes total sense. What about somebody that comes out of the military directly, but doesn't have the education? Would you uh, need to have the education first? Yeah, uh, bachelor's degree is mi mandatory. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, mo almost all military experience and law enforcement experience uh, counts as that professionalized work experience, since that's sort of very, very close to uh, the kind of work that we do. So yeah, and I would say, uh, I think the last time we ran the stats, usually like 25%-ish uh, of our applicant pool, um, you know, comes with that degree uh, or that, that experience field. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's, it is not an insignificant part of our application pipeline for sure. And we definitely want those people. We depend on those people and they make great agents. Uh, but it is definitely not the case that um, all special agents come from a criminal justice or um, um, law enforcement or military uh, background uh, at all. Um, and again, just so you know, we're talking about, so like every year we're looking to hire between, you know, maybe 850, a thousand agents uh, to get that number through the back end of the very long pipeline. Mm -hmm. We need about 27,000 people to hit apply now every year to get our thousand out the back end. Um, so, you know, it's just, we just need a lot of people and a lot of really, yeah, yeah, a lot of really good people, you know, to make it through the multiple rounds of testing, the physical fitness test, the background investigation, all those kinds of things. So where do you feel, uh, if, if you were to look at statistics, where are you seeing most of the candidates kicking out at different various, you know, you've got obviously the initial application, you probably have some sort of pre-screen, then you've mm -hmm. got, you know, obviously the testing, the physical testing, and I'm sure there's some other aptitude testing. Where, where do you typically see candidates falling out in the process? Yeah, great question. So um, for the agent job specifically, uh, you have to take a standardized test, then you come and have sort of a meet and greet, which is half pre-screen interview um, and half, do you really know what you're signing up for 
briefing. Like, you will be carrying a gun. You will be there for 20 weeks. You will be moving wherever we send you. Like, there's a certain reality check there that we just want to make sure people know. Um, then you go to take a written test, and then you do a panel interview. If you get through all of that, then typically that's when you're going to get the job offer. Um, you know, through that stage, you know, we might lose, um, you know, 50% of the people at, you know, phase one, uh, the first test, and then, you know, maybe 80% of the people get through the meet and greet, because that's pretty reasonable. Um, about, you know, 50% of the people get through the panel interview. Um, and then really the big uh, issue is the polygraph exam and the, the rest of the background investigation. So that's depending on um, how complicated your life is. Uh, that might be anywhere from four to 12 months. Um, oh, wow. And okay. yeah, and one of the things we sort of talk about is that's not a, it's not a measurement of, are you a bad person? That's not really what it is. The background investigation is a measure of risk, right? How risky is it to give you, agent or any other bureau employee, um, access, potential access to top secret information, you know, and what damage that could do if that's, you know, spilled or, you know, given out. So, um, you know, sometimes the risk is about your past and your activities and your behavior, definitely, for sure. Uh, but sometimes the risk is, um, you know, about things that are harder or impossible for you to control, right? So um, I often tell candidates, you know, if your uncle is a Colombian drug lord, there's, that's not on you, but there's really nothing you can do about it. But like, that is too risky for the FBI. So um, we lose about half, half of the candidates in the polygraph, uh, and then about another third again in the background investigation. And that's, that's for all, for all positions. So except for the agent role, um, you know, which is very extensive, the intelligence analyst, which is another job, which has a similar role, but no physical fitness test, um, for all other jobs of the Bureau, we're really looking at getting three acceptances for every vacancy that we're trying to fill because two are going to fall out of the background process and one will get through on, a, yeah. on average. Yeah. So we have a lot of statistical modeling. We run like a million, um, you know, projected attrition reports. Uh, so, you know, data is always really important, like it is in TA to almost all of us now, um, to really think about like how we can kind of get ahead of the, the, the attrition curve. Yeah, and we have to apologize. Somebody mowing a lawn out out here. Hopefully, it's not bleeding into my mic. But that's like, no, you're good. I mean, yeah. that's the and that's the last year and a half we've been like dogs. Yeah. We all know which employees <laughs> have pets now, right? So it's fine. Yeah. 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 So, so um, you you have that's that's quite a bit of uh, a lead time from the time a person hits the apply now button till the time they actually are left out into the world to be an agent or to be an FBI employee without anybody kind of in a, in a probationary type of situation. I mean, you're looking at, would you say over, well over a year? Yeah. I mean, I would say on average, on average nine to 12 months, the, you know, if you're applying for a, you know, one of those other roles, budget analyst, forensic accountant, HR specialist, uh, IT specialist, they don't have the, um, all those tests in front. So for them, it's apply, get interviewed, get the offer, start the background, right? So for them, it's still like nine to 12 months. Uh, we prioritize agent backgrounds in our, the, the pool, uh, the, the group in our, in the FBI that does background investigations, they prioritize the agent applications because the, the seats at the academy um, and the class schedule, that's a hard constraint. So there are 200 seats per class. If you miss a slot, you cannot get that back again because you can only have 200 per class. So um, one of the things we really emphasize is making sure that we hit those numbers to get those. And it's, it's a mix of agents and intelligence analysts that take that 200 seats and we change the ratio. But, you know, we want to make sure that 200 bodies are sitting in those seats. So, you know, agent background investigations tend, you know, the, the front end is much longer, but then once you get into the background, that's usually much shorter than other bureau employees because we're, we're really prioritizing you you know, in that process, just to make sure that no matter what, you know, with the fallout, we're going to hit that 200, you know, body count every, and that's like five or six times a year. Yeah. And I'm just thinking from a workforce planning perspective, that's got to be brutal to try to figure out, okay, I, I have a potential opportunity coming up. You got to plan a, not, I mean, most of us, we re, are reactive. Somebody quits or turnover, or we move somebody into a different role. And now we can go off and do an active a recruitment. But for you, you're really looking at a year in advance yep. and more yeah. to, to plan for that. That's got to be in. Yeah. So um, I would say over the last five years, that a big part of what we've done to really try to help ourselves and sort of transform, um, you know, hiring is build a huge uh, data team. And that is, that is not, that is my partner, but that, that does not fall under me. I am the, you know, consumer of their data. 
Uh, but we basically like scoured the FBI, stole everybody that we could find, you know, called in every chit to get the best, you know, data people so we could build a great data team. Um, and then started to do all this, you know, modeling to your point. Uh, you know, what, did the, what does it look like? Um, you know, not just for agents, but for every job in the FBI. For the agent role, you have to model, you know, what is the potential fallout rate at every stage? How many people have to go through? You know, when are they going to land? And then we're, we're mirroring that versus agent attrition. Um, you know, and so one of the like bonus challenges we had is an agent career is typically in law enforcement 20 years. Uh, that's the normal career. Uh, and then they get to retire with full benefits. And uh, 20 years ago um, was 9-11. And, uh, you know, we had a huge hiring boom right after that. So we're sort of in the middle of this like very natural high agent attrition, you know, through no fault of anybody's. They're just reaching the natural lifespan. So, you know, at the same time, um, that we're really overhauling uh, agent hiring the last couple of years to try to like meet our numbers and bring in more diversity, you know, really look at our process, really respond to a modern labor market. Um, you know, we're also dealing with this attrition. On the, what we call the professional staff side, you know, we, everybody's really focused on like, how many empty seats do I have today? And they could just never, of course, they could never get filled because even if you take, take every action to fill that seat today, it's going to be nine to 12 months before that body walks in. And in the interim time, two or three more people have left. And so you're always behind. So we worked with our team to create these um, forward-looking uh, attrition forecasts. So now we ask all of our internal hiring managers to look at their uh, data dashboard uh, and say, hey, we're predicting in nine months for every job role under your organization, you know, within the FBI, uh, how many people are you going to have in a seat? So that accounts for... The, all the anticipated attrition to, you know, outside the FBI or also two other job roles in the FBI, so like internal movement. And then everybody that's in background now, how many of them will get out and land in the next nine months? Uh, so how many job offers do you have to make today to try to hit 100% with a three to one, you know, ratio? Uh, so it's a lot of math and it took our internal people really, a, that was like revolutionary for that, for internal hiring managers to even just like think about that model. So it took us probably about like three years to really get hiring managers in line with like, no, I'm telling you, take, you can like make 10 offers today. And I have two vacancies. I'm like, make 10 offers today. Like <laughs> look at the model, right? That's telling you that in nine months you will have X number of vacancies. So yeah, it takes you know, workforce, super, takes workforce yeah, yeah. playing to a whole different level. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's been bonkers, but like super interesting. And it's really helped us improve our fill rates and a lot of really critical uh, jobs. And so um, you know, really much more able to, you know, meet the mission. And that's kind of, you know, in our organization, that's kind of what we always take it back to whenever we get like internal pushback. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Or that's new. You know, we always try to take it back to like, this will help the mission of the FBI move forward and think of what you could do with all your slots filled. Right. So. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things that I'm pretty surprised at is not only, and I, and I guess it makes sense because if you're in an organization that has access to, to pretty sensitive data or could be in contact with somebody that has access to pretty sensitive data you have to be vetted too um the the fact that even just kind of your standard worker b quote unquote um has to go through the same process that if oh, yeah. a, an investigative agent or somebody that would have access to classified information directly yeah um, so from a from a background investigation point of view like if you want to touch a computer to do any kind of work at the bureau which is like 100 percent of the people these days yeah. yeah you have to have a top secret clearance Wow, that's crazy. So I guess that paints puts into perspective the hiring process. And if you're a job seeker looking to get into the FBI, probably I would say pr practice some patience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, when, you know, we get that question all the time. And I, what I kind of want to reassure people is like, look, almost all government agencies, they are doing tasks and missions that are defined by law that are going to be here for a while. You know, it's not like people are going to start being good tomorrow. So like the FBI will be here forever. The need will continue to exist. It's not like some, you know, Silicon Valley startup that might fold tomorrow. So your window of opportunity is very small, right? That it's just not the case, right? So you sort of have to be in it for the long haul, right? If you're the kind of person that's committed to making the world a better place, that is not time sensitive. Like you're going to be doing whatever activity you do, whether it's volunteer work or whatever, you know, whatever you're doing right now, to try to improve your community um, and you you know working for the FBI and applying for the FBI and waiting for that opportunity and you know hanging there in there with us during that long process that's just all sort of a part of the you know sort of this lifelong commitment to you know I, I'm really in it to you know serve my community and and you know make the world better.
Now, what if you're somebody that is going through the hiring, you know, whether it's a special agent or just a regular role, and you either the, the background holds you back, you, you don't pass the background check, or you don't, if, as an, an agent, maybe you don't pass the physical requirement. What kind of, um, is there, first of all, is there anything that they can do if they get the rejection for I mean, the background? You can't really, it's not going to change, but yeah. um, so that's probably you're, you either get in or you don't. Yeah, so a couple things to unpack there, right? So um, if you fail any part of the agent test before you get your offer, right? So phase one, the interview, you know, you usually get like two bites of the apple. So it will make you go through a mandatory waiting period, but you can try again. Um, when it comes to the physical fitness test, you have um, an unlimited number of tries to take that within a year. And we, we say, hey, generally right before we're going to get you through the end of the background, that's where we're gonna to want to start, have you start doing that. And of course, there's a million things online. We have an app to train yourself. So we're talking to you very early about, you know, what it takes to pass the PFT because you can't just like, I'm in great shape. I'm like, you know, you have to train for the PFT. It is a hard test. So, you know, we're talking to people about that. Yeah, if you fail the background investigation, uh, the only ways that that is survivable really is maybe, um, you made a drug admission early and you admitted it. We did not catch you in a lie. Uh, and usually there's some kind in a lot of the drug policy, uh, there's a waiting period. So it's like, okay, um, come back to us in three, three years or 10 years or whatever the policy allows. Um, the other thing that might uh, be significantly different is um, you are at significant risk because your financial status is, um, you know, too, um, you know, too leveraged or too unstable. You know, um, and of course, that's something that might improve later and the risk would go away. One of the things I think we're really talking about as an agency, and of course, all the agencies uh, in the federal government that have, that use security clearance, we sort of all use the same, um, you know, basic threshold and basic measures of um, risk, um, is what the um, whole, you know, uh, last year and a half and how that sort of just upended people's lives and people lost their jobs and became financially unstable and what that meant, like, what does that mean for background investigation and security clearance and things like that? And I don't think there's any real consensus uh, on that yet. Um, the only thing I would say is like, you know, everybody who's working your background investigation, the agents who are investigating you, I mean, they're people too, like they went through the same world. I think in general, you know, people understand that sometimes you get into situations that are very difficult and hard to control. And I think what the FBI is always looking for is, are you taking whatever personal responsibility you can? Are you trying to resolve the problem? Are you trying to run away from it? Um, the biggest problem is people who try to hide things. Um, and I'm, I always kind of am mystified by that. I mean, it's not that we, you know, everybody was like, are you, you know, tapping everybody's phones in America? Like, obviously not, right? Like there are very strong laws about like when you can get information on people. But at the same time, when you're going a back under a background investigation, you have literally signed a piece of paper that says, I am authorizing the FBI to look into my background and find out all about me. Mm -hmm. And we're really good at finding things out. So like, if you lie, we're going to find it. And inevitably, we're going to confront you on it. And like half the time they say, yeah, I just didn't think it would look really good if I said that. I'm like, well, lying about it does not look better. And now, you know, you're, you're out. Blacklisted, like, yeah. I mean, integrity is one of our core values. So that is, that is a 100% you're you're out 100 mm -hmm. for sure if we feel like there's an integrity issue yeah and even in the uh, the private sector the same not to the same degree we don't have the same we do have some investigative capabilities but not certainly not to the level of of the fbi but you don't want to be lying about things in your background that would pop or come up because it's it's something that they will find um so that that's a good call out yeah for sure yeah so it if you are right now, it sounds like there's a huge challenge from getting enough people in the pipeline. I mean, imagine from a candidate flow perspective, do you have to do a lot of outreach or do you feel, do you get a lot of candidates that come in? Uh, it's a great question. I think it's one thing we really struggle with in TA, uh, you know, overall. Uh, but I think we have the same challenge, which is in most cases, we have plenty of human beings applying to jobs, right? But is it the right people? Is it the, you know, do they have the right skill sets? Um, what kind of experience do they have? In the special agent ranks, you know, our applicant numbers are good now. Like we spent the last five years getting our applicant numbers up to where we need them. And we've really focused a lot on um, making sure that we're having a diverse uh, group of people uh, come into the agent pool, minorities, women. Um, you know, for us, it's really important that 
um, the whole FBI, but even more specifically the agent uh, population because of the criticality of mission that it looks like the American people that it is protecting and that it's representing, right? That's how we you know, maintain our legitimacy as a law enforcement uh, agency. Um, and that has definitely been a challenge over time. Um, and so, you know, we do have quite an active um, employment marketing program, recruiting program, uh, both to, you know, bring in entry level people into all these professional staff roles. You know, that's great. We have a great entry level, you know, university uh, intern uh, hiring program to bring in, you know, create a great talent pipeline there. Um, but to make sure that, you know, people who might not picture themselves at the FBI can imagine themselves in the role of an FBI special agent. And I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about, and I'm sure it's the same uh, in other places, is that, you know, lack of imagination. Like, you have to picture yourself in that role. Like, that is a thing I could do. And that's where, you know, um, you know, sometimes te television helps us and sometimes it hurts us. And this is sort of in um, a little bit of both, right? Certainly it's the case that, you know, FBI focused movies and TV shows are putting more diverse people in those roles and that's great for us and we definitely are doing the same um you know and trying to uh, increase and being successful on increasing the diversity of the, of the population too um but i mean it's like i said before it's not all lear jets and serial killers uh either right the fbi needs a lot of account accountants who are physically fit to become special agents and work um money laundering cases um and we have a huge forensic accounting program uh, you know, a forensic accountant is a totally separate job, right? So um, that's one of our hardest to fill roles because we want like people who really, you know, not just their accountants, but they have really strong background in that forensic uh, investigative accounting, right? Which is a very specific niche. Uh, but, you know, almost every, you know, investigation now has a huge financial component. Um, you know, it's always follow the money, right? So, you know, that's always something we're looking for as well. Yeah, I could imagine a, just such a broad skill set for these different roles, how it, it could be a challenge. If you are, um, from a, a candidate's perspective, if you were to give any piece of advice, say I wanted to get into being a, a special agent, let's just kind of focus on that for now. What would what advice would you give me if I'm if I'm I really have my heart set on it? Maybe I don't have the years of experience. Obviously, I have to go and get some real world experience. But what what advice would you give the the job seeker who has had their heart set on becoming an agent? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, really try to understand what the job requires. Right. So do your research. You know, read. Every, I mean, there's a ton of information on our website and our social media channels about what it's like to be an agent, what the roles require, things like that. Really look at the, um, we talk about the agent skill sets and the competencies. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to present yourself um, as a candidate for special agent when you are really ready. Um, there is an age limit, right? It's you have to be between 23 and 36 and a half to, you know, you have to start um, so that you can get your, you know, 20 years of career and before a mandatory retirement. Um, but everybody's always like, oh, 24, I have to start. I'm like, no, the, the average age of new special agents is 30. So it's not that you can't join earlier. I mean, that's the average. But what I would say is the single biggest thing, when I talk to the agents that serve as our um, assessors, right? There, it's three agents on every interview panel. You know, when they get to that, when the applicants get to that phase uh, and they're talking about, this is when you're, we're asking you the questions about, tell us about your experience. You know, the single biggest thing that we hear over and over again is, this person is gonna be a great candidate in five years because they bring all the right things to the table, but they just do not have enough breadth of life experience to give us really great answers to, you know, the standard behavioral interview questions, like how have you collaborated? How have you shown leadership? You know, how have you problem solved through something difficult? You know, the, the things that you could imagine, you know, you would, um, you would ask at that kind of interview, you know, they just don't have very robust answers because their experience is limited. So, um, and unfortunately you can only interview twice. So if you start too early and you blow it, now you've got one chance at the apple again, right? And I, I would just say like, if it's something you really want and this is like your dream, then I would say, please don't rush it. Like, I know that is a really hard thing to say and really a hard thing to hear, but you just really have to think about like what, what, you're, what you're in it for. I mean, the FBI is not, the FBI agent is not a first job out of college. It is not even usually a second job out of college. It is more often a second or third job out of post-college, right? That's just 
usually how it spins out because it's usually, you know, I get my first out of a college, I do that for a couple of years and then I like go into something else and now I'm in a role of bigger responsibility, right? And it's usually like that growth over time and you, you've you learned about yourself, you've learned how to show leadership, even if you've never supervised people directly, you've led a project, you've led a team, you know, you've had that opportunity to like lead people, you know, that's something that's really important to aid to the agent, um, you know, career. So that's just what, those are the big things that I would say. So, uh, so you have two, two shots at it. And then if you don't pass the second interview. process, whether, yeah, the interview, and is that, as at the interview or is that the entire process? So you go into it and you don't make it through. Yeah. So for the, for the agent career ladder, um, you have sort of two shots at all. Like you can try the phase one exam twice. You can try to get through the meet and greet twice. You can try to get through the phase two interview and the written exam twice, right? So, you know, you can try each one, but, you know, if you fail it twice, we're like, okay, you're, you're probably never going to pass and now whatever. Um, and then you go to the background investigation. Obviously, if you fail, you know, we sort of talked about that yeah. uh, already. Can you, can you fail maybe one part, like one section the first time and then fail a different section the second time and then be able to still go for a third time to get to, to pass? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, each, it's, it's just it's, each section. It's two times for each section. Yeah, okay. so it's, it is, okay. and it is very common that you might take, take the phase one, blow it the first time. Okay, wait six months or a year, whatever it is. Take phase one again, pass, go through the meet and greet, pass the meet and greet get to phase two, um, fail the phase two. Okay, now you're in a, I think it's, uh, I think it's a year waiting period, it might be six months. It's on the website. But the point is like, when you apply again, you don't have to start at phase one again. Like you've already passed phase one. You know, you might, we might do a meet and greet again, just depending on how much time has passed, make sure you haven't, you know, become a crazy person in the interview time. But like, you don't, but you pass phase one, you don't have to take that again. You can go, you'll basically go straight to phase two. Or let's say that you get all the way through that, you get your offer, which you're super excited about, we're excited. You're going through the background investigation, you pass your poly, um, which is great. Um, you're in the background investigation and now, you know, it's getting ready and then you fail your, your physical fitness test for the first time. Okay, well, we said you have a year to, 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 to do that. So you can take that as many times as possible um, within the year of, you know, your clearance is good. Now all you have to do is yeah. pass the physical fitness test and then you're like in. So you can start the academy. Um, and so, you know, that you can take as multiple times, as many times as you want. Do they, do they have to, if you pass through maybe two or three rounds of it and then you fail at a certain point, do you fast track back to that point or do you have to go through the whole process again? Yeah, I mean, generally they'll push you back to where you were. Um, once you get your background you know, you get your clearance. That's basically good for a year. So that's why we say, hey, from the time yeah. you're cleared and ready to go, except for the physical fitness test, you, you know, you have a year to pass it and then we can we can still use the clearance, right? Now, in that year, if you do a bunch of different things, like I'm traveling to China 15 times, then obviously, you know, we're going to reinvestigate, we're going to double check, you know, make sure that, you know, there's nothing about what you did in the last year or so that, you know, would change the investigative decision. Um, that's very very atypical so to walk in the door you need to go through it sounds like there's a prelim assessment and the, what is that that assessment is like is it like a personality profile or something like that yeah, for, the, for the agent role yeah, yeah that yeah the phase one is a typical standardized test you know measure of competencies personality problem solving a uh, situational judgment uh you know the kind of thing you you know work with a you know I, industrial organizational psychologist sure. like nutritionists to develop it take it took us like two years to update the test um yeah and then there's a writing test uh, and there's a, there's a sample on our website in the special agent hiring pack. Uh, it's really good. You know, the writing test is, hey, we're going to give you a bunch of different materials. And we're asking you to like read through, synthesize some information and write a effectively some kind of report, uh, which is a, an agent assessors grade those reports. So in the preparation materials, there is a, you know, a very mini example of um, here's the here's an example of some kinds of materials and the kind of assignment that you would get. Here's a great example of an answer, and this is why this is great. Here's a very common, unfortunately, but very terrible example, and this is why this one is terrible. And then here's an example of a response that's kind of in the middle, and this is why this one's like, okay, but here are the weaknesses and strengths. So we're trying to like at least model for people, like, hey, in the writing exam and the kind of writing we're talking about, the kind of synthesis and analysis we're talking about, this is what we mean, and this is what makes good answer versus this what makes a very common but bad answer. Um, you know, so we try to give that to candidates. So, you know, they have, you know, we, we want you to pass, right? Like yeah. we want you to do well. So we're trying to like help you succeed as much as you can. So that's on our website too. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate actually I worked at Amazon for a little bit and uh, we same same philosophy. We wanted people to succeed. So we'd give you every bit of advice that we could in order to get people past because ultimately I think there is a misconception about recruiting and human resources in general where they think that we're just some evil people that like to reject people and and give them bad news and and that couldn't be further from the truth for me getting a rec filled or getting a position filled not only does it make me feel good to give somebody an opportunity and then they you know they can it, in some cases it can change their lives but it also gets that that piece of work off my plate gives me some equity with my internal customers and then I can move on to the next one because the recs still come in you know so yeah preparing oh, 100%. People. I mean the best feeling of the world is somebody walks that interview and we're like oh my god could that I pray that person passes the back of the station because that person would be amazing right but for us it's kind of a mixed it's kind of a double-edged sword because like statistically two out of three people are going to fail so like mm -hmm. we we tell the hiring managers also like you can't get too attached to any one person, right? Because statistically, any one person is not going to make it through. So, you know, we give you the calculation, we give you the numbers, like how many, how many job offers do you have? How many people have to say yes before you can stop, right? And, you know, sometimes that's, we take, that's convincing because they, they're like, well, let's just see what happens. I'm like, okay, so what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to wait six months. They're going to fail. And then we'll be exactly where we are, but six months later. And now you'll have five vacancies instead of the two. So I'm going to need you to just like make that offer, let that you know that now that's out of our hands, right? We can't control the yeah. background because that, and I need you to just keep interviewing other people. And then, you know, and everybody's always like, oh my God, what happens if like three people get through? And I would, I'm always like, I would dream of having that problem of too <laughs> many top secret cleared people, but that is just not a widespread problem that we have. But uh, we do have um, sort of a, an approved for hire dashboard that all of our internal hiring managers can have. And so, you know, I mean, it definitely does happen where like two people get through and we only have one vacancy. And so, you know, either which whoever was the primary, whoever gets through first or whatever the case may be, we'll get the job and then we'll communicate with that other candidate and say, hey, we can put you on this approved for hire dashboard. Your clearance is good for a year. This is open to all hiring managers in the bureau. Um, internally, of course, we actively push those candidates to hiring managers because they are top secret cleared and they can start basically tomorrow. Um, and that is a huge advantage um, because of course, and not that this has ever happened to you, I'm sure, is the desperate call from a hiring manager. I need somebody tomorrow. I was like, well, you're probably not going to get somebody tomorrow. So I'm just going to let you know, like approve for hire dashboard. That's your best <laughs> bet, right? Otherwise it's going to be nine months. So pick an acting and move some work around. Yeah, that you know, or look at your, yeah, look at your hiring, <laughs> you know, attrition model, do the work now, right? Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that just sounds like a whole different, I guess from a difference between private and public is we obviously don't have, we, it feels like we have this mat, these massive hurdles to, to jump over and you clearly have more than we do, um, but it, it, it can seem like a gauntlet. So the person who is, interviewing for the FBI probably should keep their options open for other uh, opportunities <laughs> while yeah, they're- I mean, what we typically tell you is like, look, if in the best circumstances, we're talking about maybe a year. That is a year that you can continue to grow and develop. And what we want are people, like we said, are intellectually curious, they're devoted to learning. So, you know, we want people who come in, a, you know, nine months, a year later, and they've improve their skills. They've learned more. They're bringing even more to the table, right? And that is the best. Um, so that's what we really tell people is like, use that year. Because worst case scenario for you, you get through nine months and you fall out of background, right? Which, I mean, it definitely happens. And we try to be very honest about that upfront. Like it definitely happens. Um, so what, do, what will you have done? You will have spent nine months improving your skill set. And that can go forward somewhere else. So like now you're yep. sort of hedging your bets in either direction. And that's definitely the, the right way to, to think about it. We ask Candace. Yeah. That. And we should be doing that anyway, regardless if we're interviewing for the FBI. Yeah. yeah so that's, course. that's really great advice. Yeah. So uh, one other, a couple of other just kind of mini questions inside of what you talked about, because there's a lot, really a lot there. Um, the, the, the relocation anywhere, I want to make sure people understand that they go into the FBI, they're not going to necessarily choose where they get assigned or stationed. Is that yeah, correct? Well, that, that's very specific to the agent and this other role called intelligence analyst. And that's very, very clear on the you know application. All other jobs at the FBI, and again, you know, every year we're hiring, you know, a thousand agents and 2000 other, other things, right? Everything. Mm -hmm. else. So all that other stuff, that's very much like I'm applying for a 
you know, forensic accountant job in Milwaukee. I'm applying for a, you know, budget analyst at, you know, Winchester, Virginia. So that, that's very much, I'm applying for this job in this location. Um, but the agent role and the intelligence analyst role, um, those are, hey, you're going, um, you're going to go, you're going to apply, you're committing to, um, I'm going to go where the bureau needs me. You're going to go to Quantico to the basic field training class for an extended number of weeks. And you're going to train, you know, intelligence analysts and agents train together. Then I think it's at week 12, the intel analysts finish and they leave. And then the agents stay for an additional, I think, five weeks. Um, and they get, that's when they get the like, this is how we break down doors. And this is how we like push people to the ground and uh, handcuff them and all the things that like agents might have to do. So um, you, what you do is you basically rank while you're, when you're there, I think it's in week five, you rank all 56 field offices, like, you know, one to 56 uh, and say, this is where I want to go. And then uh, we have another team. Um, I don't have to do that part, thank God, uh, but my other, my partners do. Uh, and they basically look at like, hey, what are the fill rates in all the field offices? What skill sets and re requests you know, do the field offices have in? Like um, El Paso, obviously, you know, almost always needs additional Spanish speakers. Um, but we might have like, hey, if there's anybody with a cyber background, these three offices have the highest need for a cyber agent. Um, this office really needs uh, an accountant uh, for it because they have a lot of white hawk crime uh, vacancies on those squads. Or, um, hey, we have a lot of remote offices, um, you know, out of the big square states. Um, it's very hard to put new agents in those remote offices. So we try to um, only put agents, new agents there who do have a law enforcement background, like they were a police officer because they succeed very well. Even though they're a brand new agent, they understand what it's like to be law enforcement in a rural area. So sometimes that's a request. And so, you know, our team will basically match up the fill rates, those, the candidates' desires, the needs. Uh, we try to get everybody within their top 10. Um, and I would say a very high percentage of candidates get within their top 10, not all. Um, uh, and of course, the largest offices, Washington, D.C., uh, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, you know, those are those offices almost need almost always need a large number of agents from every class uh, just because, they, you know, they're the largest offices. And so they just have the most natural churn. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and then it's the, tough. Yeah, it's, it's not. So you got to be flexible, really, is kind of what it boils uh, down to. I mean, you you're definitely committing to a lifestyle and. Uh, you know, you're committing to the mission. So, and that is not for everybody and that is okay, right? Like that's what the 499 other jobs are. I mean, I did not become an agent, you know, for a lot of reasons, but one of which is that I did not want to give that control over to uh, the agency. And that's fine. I mean, you have to be willing to carry a gun, right? That is also not for some people. And that, again, that's okay. Um, you know, I think it's, this is where you have to know yourself. Uh, the other thing we really talk about is that if you're married or you do have a partner, like you really, you know, you really have to make sure that they're on board uh, with that because this may be this amazing adventure for you uh, but they are being dragged on that amazing adventure it may not be their amazing adventure right and um they may say they're willing to go anywhere but when you come home and you're like hey um i'm assigned to san antonio and they're like okay san antonio that's not bad yeah it's actually brownsville which is like at the very tip of texas which is part of our san antonio office and they're like i'm not okay with that well you're in the you're in the fbi academy you're top secret clear you've been there for you know, six weeks now already, you've already, you've already signed, you've given away your apartment or you, you know, let your landlord know you're leaving or you're trying to sell your house. So like, you need to make sure your spouse and partner are like on board uh, with this too. Yeah. It's not unlike the military life um, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are definitely some um, applicable things. Um, and, you just, and, just we want to be full disclosure, you know? Yeah. And I think that's important to point out. And then the other thing, the mandatory retirement. So there is a mandatory 20 year for an agent? Uh, no. Law, so law enforcement um, uh, jobs, especially the agent job, uh, 20 years uh, in, you qualify for your full pension. Uh, but there's a mandatory age uh, requirement. I think it's 56 and a half. Uh, so typically, um, depending on what age you start, you might, uh, you almost always hit your 20 years and then you have like X number of years before you are mandatory retirement, right? And that you could walk out at any time and you get your full, you know, pension that, um, you know, you have earned, uh, but uh, but you're not yet mandatory. And then, uh, and that's about being, that's about the physical fitness requirements for the job. Um, so that yeah, sense. that's that's that, yeah. Uh, but that again, that's old, that's only the agent job. So uh, the professional sport category, um, it's a little different. Like on the one hand, you have to work 30 years before you get your full uh, pension, which is still a very good pension. Um, uh, but there is also no mandatory 
retirement age. And so, uh, you know, depending on when you, and of course you can start at any age because there's no, um, you know, we could hire you whenever, whatever you are, as long as you meet the skill set. So, um, you know, I've worked with some amazing people in, the, in my career, especially when I was working with the linguists in the foreign language program. Um, a lot of people come into the foreign language program as a retirement career from whatever else. So the average age of new linguists is like 67. Um, and some of them stay till their 80s. Uh, and as long as you could like, you know, your, your communicative skill set is good and you can still translate, interpret, like we don't need you to leave. We want you to stay. Okay. So, I'm curious when somebody's coming in from the public sector, from the private sector into the public sector, what do you think are some of the key things that they should be aware of or the key differences? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think in a lot of ways, the federal government, you know, no matter where you are, is definitely more structured than uh, private sector tends to be, right? So the Office of Personnel Management, which is like the government's HR shop, they usually lay out the um, controls and the guidelines under which, you know, most federal agencies uh, higher. Of course, Department of Defense has sort of like its own schema and CIA, a couple other people do, but like the FBI falls in the same uh, Title V category. Um, uh, and so we follow those. So, you know, all um, job titles are a matter of public record. Um, you know, the, you, you have to get that approved. You can't just randomly make up any job you want. You can't just randomly um, have any title. Pay is very controlled. Um, so, like, for example, um, there's a lot of negotiation in the private sector for job offers. Uh, we're much more tightly controlled uh, in how we can negotiate with people. Um, every time you apply for a job, they'll, they'll be like automatic disqualifiers like U.S. citizenship, can't default on a federal loan, you know, the normal things. Um, and then every federal job is either um, you're qualifying based on education or work experience or a combination of both. And so if the job says this degree in this field is required, there is no negotiating you can do away from that. That is a total dead, you know, the, you're, dead, you're dead in the water if you do not have that degree. If you want to be a forensic accountant, you must have an accounting degree. You could have work, you could have X number of years of work experience, but OPM says, hey, if the federal government wants to hire an accountant, they must have an accounting degree. There's certain non-negotiables. That's that's very few jobs in the federal government. I mean, doctor, nurse, nurse lawyer, the ones you would think about, like you have to have that degree. More often, it's education or work experience. So um, I could have a bachelor's degree, and that qualifies me at a certain, you know, entry level salary, like a what we call grade level GS um, mm -hmm. government schedule seven or five. Um, and a master's degree might bring me at this level, or a PhD might bring me at this level, or this number of years of work experience equivalent to this kind of work brings me in at the same level. What you really want to do, though, is look when the when the role says. The job will almost always say specialized experience. We're looking for a year of specialized experience, and it'll give you some example bullets, right? It's very important that that experience you have is super obvious on your resume. Because in a typical um, hiring action for the federal government, you're going to apply whatever, you know, uh, ATS or tracking system we're going to have is going to knock you out if you hit any of the, you know, you know non-qualifiers like citizenship, things like that. And then you're going to go to an HR specialist, which in the private sector is kind of like the recruiter equivalent to screen. Mm -hmm. But our screenings, we're not doing phone screenings. We're using um, resume analysis. So they're looking at your resume for, do you meet the qualifications that were listed in the job posting, right? Do you have the education and or work experience and the specialized experience? And if you don't, you're out. It's not, it doesn't mean that you might not, but if we can't see it on your resume, we have 500 resumes to go through and a hiring manager breathing down our neck because they want the list tomorrow. So that's the first thing you have to know is like, it has to be obvious on your resume that you have what the posting says you need to show. So that's number one. Yeah, and, and then really yeah, quickly, let me interject there. The the you, you you essentially I say this on my channel. You get five seconds of my time uh, in order to get through, and and the, the same thing applies. It's uh, at the FBI. You get five seconds of our time to catch our attention. So your resume absolutely has to be completely honed in, mm -hmm. and it has to be completely optimized, and it has to be customized to the role. Yeah, and um, I think 100%. that that's one of the biggest issues that somebody gets gets frustrated. They they have this experience, but they're not able to sell it correctly, and you only get five seconds and people get, they get frustrated by that. Yeah, so yeah. there is a way to position yourself effectively if you use strategy in your res and actually created a course on exactly how to do that. It's called resume rocket fuel. And it teaches you exactly how to get your resume to the point where somebody at the FBI would see the things that they need to see. So if you're somebody that is struggling 
with your job search and where you're not sure that your resume is going to get you past that first level, I highly suggest checking that out. So I'm yeah. sorry, that then you were just about to go into the next point. Yeah, and so then, uh, and remember, your resume is sort of doing double duty because, and I'm sure it's exactly the same, that like it has to get through the initial screening, so it has to be super obvious. But then what the qualification is, is not always what the hiring manager wants to see. Like they usually, um, especially for us, like they, because they have no control over what OPM says the qualifications are. So sometimes the hiring manager is like, well, I don't care. I'm like, you don't care, but like, I have to care, right? So they're like, but I want somebody with this skill set. So if it'll, and that's where you'll see in the job posting, it'll be like, these are the duties, right? So these are what I'm actually asking this person to do who works for me in my unit, in my piece of the organization. So, um, you know, depending on the role, um, the duties could be slightly different, you know, obviously depend, even the same job category, but different parts of the organization, right? So that's where you want to say, but the duties that you are going to be doing, you want to show the closest, um, you know, related skills on your resume as well. Because as always, like what you want is for that resume to land in front of the hiring manager and he has a problem that's this shape and you want to position your resume that like, oh my God, this person's resume is that shape. This could be the perfect person to fill the role. And they've literally given you the blueprint on what that person looks like, because that is what is in the job posting. So you have to, I mean, I don't, and this sounds bad, but like you have to work, like you have to like 100%. work on your resume. And like, uh, and then if you get through, you're going to get interviewed. And I, I mean, I know it's the same in the private sector, but the number of people that show up completely unprepared for an interview yep. is baffling. And it kind of pisses people off, honestly, the, the hiring manager, because now you're wasting our time. Because you've not taken this seriously. 100%. I think those two are the two biggest gaps that I see in recruiting, even in the, in the private sector. And it sounds like you have exactly the same experiences, not having resumes that get you. I mean, I, I, I actually was recruiting and uh, earlier today, and I had a, a person that I have a job that I'm not getting good candidate flow on. And I've actually got a, a candidate that applied and, the resume was so bad that I sat there for a good 10 minutes debating back and forth whether or not I wanted to call them um, because there might be something in that resume that I could use, but now it's making me have to work harder. I know that sounds really bad because it's like, I, I, well, you have to do your, do more of your job, but when you have so many wrecks to fill and yeah. so many, it, it's, it, you really have to make it as easy as possible for the hiring authorities to consume your resume and figure out whether or not you're a fit or you're not a fit. Cause again, it's this five second, this five second thing. And then when you do get into the interviewing process, you're right. The number of people that come into it without even looking at a, a job description or even looking at what the company, what a company does or what department they're moving into or interviewing for. I've had, I've had candidates who don't even know the company, like when I call them, they don't even, or they forget that I'm calling them yeah. or something. It's like, and then going through an interview where they've clearly not put any preparation into how to answer basic behavior-based questions um, or how to position themselves to sell the, you know, their value proposition appropriately. And it does, it does piss people off. If I have a dud, if I send over a candidate that I've said, okay, this is a decent candidate in my hiring manager interviews. And then I get feedback that that guy was horrible. It makes me look bad, you know, mm -hmm. because now I'm, I'm putting my stamp on somebody and it, it's actually it, it kind of a, an integrity. Uh, my, they're questioning my ability to do my job. Um, so yeah, being prepared, it will go a long way to get you in the yeah, FBI. Yeah. And I mean, obviously there's a, I mean, Thank God for YouTube, right? I mean, there's a million YouTube videos now about like how to write a better resume and how to prepare for an interview. But like generally what I tell people is, again, you go back to the posting. There's usually either a list of competencies or a list of duties. Do your brainstorming, you know, figure out what are your best examples. But then, you know, what I think what people, when people prepare, they sit there and they think, okay, I could talk about this story and I could talk about this. I know, but you have to do it. Like what words in what order are going to come out of your mouth to sell the story and like you have to practice that like people do not interview that often like why would they but it is a skill mm -hmm. and what's so hard really and i think what people don't understand what because of course we give feedback a lot and there's like but i'm very qualified for the job i'm like i'm sure you actually are qualified and based on the resume that you have you should be killer in this job but you did not demonstrate to us that you can follow directions and you can think analytically and critically about your own self and put that forward. And because yep. you didn't do that. And so that's, you, then you're done. And that's, I know that sounds really bad, but like that is true. And so you have to be able 
do that. We know you're nervous. Like it's not about nerves. Like we all the hiring managers are trained to like put you at ease. And we know what it's like when you're nervous, but you're you've prepared and you're getting your story out. Like that is not the issue. It's the you you just thought about what you would say, but you never actually practiced Practice it, yeah. what you would I mean, say. And it's even even your your presentation to a hiring manager, all of these different are, these different things are used as data points. Like, for example, I have another candidate that is is in a, is interviewing for a senior level role and and sent me a note saying that they we typically do a Skype or a Zoom for a for a preliminary phone screen. And this person said that they don't their their computer equipment is is so old that it doesn't it is not compatible with the latest of Zoom. They can't load Zoom or Skype or any of these things on, so they have to do it phone. And then I'm sitting there now going. I, I don't know if I want to talk to you anymore because Sounds like you do not want this job. Yeah. Because no, well, number one, if it, now you sound like a dinosaur to me, if you've got that outdated of technology and you're going to go into a, a, a high level position and, and you're, you're not able to get, learn the latest technology, that means that you're going to go in now. And now my hiring mm -hmm. managers all do their, their interviewing through zoom or Skype, especially in this climate with COVID. Of course. North. So now you're going to tell them that they have to flex and figure out a way to accommodate you versus you making it easy for them. And I'm, I'm now sitting there thinking to myself, like, you, you really need to think long and hard about that message that you're sending, you know, so when job seekers have these, these um, kind of quirks about them, you know, all of that stuff is taken into decision making process. And, and these are all data points that we and my hiring managers will say, it's not just me, the recruiter saying that, but my hiring managers will say some, you know, that you, you bring up a point about, well, you couldn't follow directions. Well, we've had people in a plant based setting where you don't do not show up in a suit because there's moving equipment, it's, it's a safety issue. We do not want people, and we tell them that when they would show up and then sure enough, people would show up in a suit and the hiring manager would call me up and say, why don't you tell them not to, so this guy showed up in a suit. I'm not gonna hire him, he can't follow instructions. And, and uh, I'll tell him, I told the guy not to, to show up in a suit. We even sent it in an email, it's in a, in a standard template that we, when we invite them. And that the guy says, if he can't follow that simple instruction, then he sure as hell isn't gonna be able to follow an instruction on the plant floor. I mean, I feel like if we could just like skywrite that, you know, above every, you know, office building. I mean, the thing is, if you're asking what can you do to set yourself apart, you can actually read what we send you and follow directions. And if you're not sure, please ask us. But like, we are not making these things up for grins and giggles, like for no reason, right? Like we want, and again, same thing. It's like, if you cannot follow this direction, which is literally written down for you, then we know you cannot follow directions on the job. It's also, we, ha we always have the, um, unprofessionalism screen out at any one time, right? It's like, you could be the best technician in the world. You could be the most amazing software engineer, but if you're a jerk to people, then we do not want you, right? And so there's usually this um, uh, sort of, a, you know, form that we can have people fill out um, that they had uh, a really negative experience. And of course, it's never just one person. Like we always investigate and verify, right? We always, you know, make sure we're not just having anybody sandbag. Uh, people, but I think external people are always like, they're everybody's looking for a reason not to hire me. I'm like, no, we are desperate to hire people. We are really trying to make the connection and make it happen because to your point, you know, I'm trying to hit my hiring numbers and I want to bring amazing people into the bureau because that is the most gratifying thing to just see them go and be, uh, be awesome and go to new jobs. And, you know, the first, um, intern I ever had for the Bureau is now a uh, senior executive section chief um, uh, in our counterterrorism division. Uh, and which is awesome, right? Cause, but he was my, the first intern that I had. And uh, you know, that is just like the best to see people succeed. So that, that's what we want. Yeah. At the end of the day, we just want people, we want butts and seats. That's, 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 it. I that's it. Just help me help you, please. Yeah. yeah. That's the, uh, that's the biggest message that comes out of this is help us help you get hired. Cause that's the, you. Yeah. Hey, this has been excellent. Been yeah, really, really, really bad. Do you have any parting words for somebody, you know, any, any final thoughts that you wanted to include that we didn't cover already um, on anything that we spoke about? Um, yeah. I mean, I would just say like, if, you know, working for the FBI specifically, the federal government um, as a whole, it is definitely, um, you are doing it for the mission, right? You know, we look at all the surveys. I'm not saying compensation is not important, but when you look at, you know, what do people, what matters? People want to do work that matters and going into public service matters. Uh, and I just really want to tell people that, like, if you, if, it, if that's not for you, please find some other way to get back to your community. Um, but there's a huge um, 
sense of just personal validation and, um, you know, just satisfaction that you get um, from serving your country. And it, I know that sounds corny, uh, but that is 100% accurate. So if you are like, as we always tell our um, computer science candidates who are making super tons of money, um, I'm like, look, you'll definitely make less money, but you might not be soulless. Uh, and if you'd like to do something that matters, come to us, right? So uh, yeah, just think about that. And if it's like, nope, it's cash or nothing, then I wish you good luck, but we are not for you. I mean, it's just that's just it, right? So like, it, it has to be the right match, just like any job. Um, and if it's not for you, that's, that's okay, right? It's not for you. Um, but it's, you can't make it something that it's not, right? Just like, you know, any other job. It, it, the organization is what it is. And so you want to really think about what is the mission of the organization. So, um, and the best way to do that is like, read about us. Like we have social media channels, like everybody else. We put up tons of, you know, articles on our uh, FBI.gov site, on our FBI job site, LinkedIn, you know, Facebook, all that stuff, you know, go to some recruiting events, read about the organization, um, you know, and think about if that sounds like something that's appealing to you, you know, please try. So if somebody wants to get their, their career started, they head obviously head over to the FBI website and- Yeah, uh, fbijobs.gov is where all our job announcements are posted. Um, and then of course we're at, at FBI jobs on Twitter, uh, FBI Federal Bureau of Investigation on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, we post a lot. FBI.gov is sort of the organization's site. It talks about the mission of the organization, press releases, or what's the FBI's doing in the news. So there's a lot of great information there. Um, so I would, I would start there. And then our, we do have a YouTube channel, which you can get to through our other channels. Uh, and there's tons of videos about people talking about their jobs, what the FBI is doing in the community. You can really learn a lot um, uh, about what we're, the organization's doing uh, if you go to our YouTube channel uh, and watch a bunch of videos. Like, that's what we're all doing now. Yeah. Yeah. This has been excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, no. Super fun. Thank time. you for the invitation. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks again.